Hello, everyone. This is Old School from WhatTheBuck.net, bringing you a little bit of a camp preview. Um, hopefully, you guys have been tuning in. I know I've been as regular as, as I should have been, uh, but it should be better than now. So we're going to get things going. we got training camp opening Saturday for you guys that are local. You get a chance to go out and see the team for the first time. If you were fortunate enough to get online <clears throat> via the One Buck Club and get your tickets, which I was. So we'll be out there at 1020 on Saturday, and I'm going to be there for every camp session. I'll try and do a video every night as far as what I see in camp. Now, with regards to signing status with the signature of of Mr. Grimm, the, I think the final seventh-round draft pick to sign. I'm not sure what he was holding out for, uh, but that leaves us uh, only one, and that's Gerald McCoy. Now, McCoy, uh, whose agent is the same as agent uh, for Sam Bradford, has said he's going to wait for Sam Bradford to sign his deal. There was a rumor that Bradford would sign today. Uh, Tim Tebow signed today. There are signings kind of trickling in over time. I don't know that they definitely need to, to be dominoes like that, but that seems to be what a lot of players like to do. When I was looking at the differentials between contracts last year and the contracts this year, uh, I found some interesting trends, and the trends are interesting in as much as they don't change much, right? So even though we, you know, everyone's claiming they want a rookie slotting system, we kind of have a rookie slotting system, and that's why people have clamored they want the number one to, to sign because that's going to tell them what they're going to get as you go down the line. There are a number of websites out there that track this data, uh, which is very, very convenient. The one I happened to use was BackseatFan.com, which has a relatively up-to-date, up-to-date data on current signatures, and I used the numbers from last year. And if you look at the data before Tim Tebow signed, now Tim Tebow's contract was a bit of an anomaly because he was a quarterback. The differential in the average contract up front uh, versus signing bonus is kind of telling. Uh, in 2009, the average contract was $17.8 million. The average signing bonus was $9.8 million. This year it's been 18.8 and 11.5. That's a 5% differential in up front and a 14% differential on the signing bonus. Now, that's for the round one guys who have leverage. For the round two guys, it flips entirely. And you go from a 7% differential on the on the signing contract, the contract value overall, some of which may never be actualized, and a 3% drop in guaranteed money. This is exactly what you'd expect in an uncertain labor time. What this means to me is if you're one of these guys in the first round, you know that your delta is going to be somewhere between 5% and 10%. Just get the deal done. You're going to lose more in perception and in endorsements by holding out and being looked as a malcontent. I just don't understand it. The money here is not that significant, especially when you consider all of the rest of the makeup of their contracts. Just get the damn deal done and get in camp. I do believe that McCoy will get into camp. Uh, I have postulated, based on the numbers, I saw a five-year deal worth $52 million max and about $35 million in guarantees. I'm not sure how much it will be signing bonuses versus guarantees, but... I think it'll be done around there. Who knows? Maybe I'll end up looking like an asshole. It's happened before. It'll happen again. Now, going into camp, there are some things we're all looking for as Bucks fans. A lot of people are looking at Donald Penn. He's not going to be there, guys. Uh, he can wait till week 10 to come in. There's nothing that has shown us that that's going to get done. There's been no talks between Mark Dominic and Donald Penn. I think we're looking squarely at DeMar Dotson. I had a slight hope that Flozell Adams might be brought in for a year, even though I'm not a huge Flozell Adams fan. But at least that way we'd have a veteran in there. But then you see the Steelers are probably going to move him to right tackle because of his foot speed. So uh, I don't see us doing anything good on that left side. And, and unless DeMar Dotson comes in and just impresses the hell out of us in training camp, Josh Freeman better have his head on the swivel, and that's the biggest concern we're going to have. I think that the rest of our guys, with the signing of Kedrick Vincent to give Zuda some challenge, Thane, Joseph, and Trueblood, I think they're all going to do better in this power blocking scheme Coach Van Jurian is going to implement. I think we're going to be better all around in that particular regard. But without that left tackle, uh, we could be in for a world of hurt. The other big questions are, did Josh Freeman really advance as much as people have said in the offseason? He's taken over the line calls for Jeff Fain. Uh, he seems to be doing all of the right things off the field. Now the question will become, can he do them on the field? Can he keep his mechanics in check? Can he forget that he's a big guy with a strong arm and step into the ball and start to deliver the ball on time and on target consistently? Furthermore, can he stop going to his primary read pre-snap and sticking with his primary read through the play? essentially being able to diagnose the play and make it through one to three reads throughout the actual evolution of the play. That's going to be critical, and it's going to be critical that our receivers, especially with the youth we're going to have at the receiving position, goes ahead and runs those routes and gives him targets, right? So when you're looking, we're, we're squarely staring at rookie X and Z, right? Uh, with with Bryant gone, even though he didn't play particularly well last year, I don't think there's any way Mike Clayton gets into either one of those positions the way he's playing. I fully believe Mike Clayton will be no longer a Buccaneer this year. Uh, I, I can't see a reason why they would keep him with the youth they've got. With Mike Williams, Aurelius Ben, and Sammy Strouder out there, Maurice Stovall bringing it up, you've got a number of other guys also that are vying for positions. I don't see why we continue to invest in a guy that continues to disappoint. It just doesn't make any sense. 
So with that kind of youth and inexperience, these guys are going to have to run their routes, run them cleanly, be where they're supposed to be. A number of Freeman's interceptions last year were, in fact, due to the receiver breaking off routes. And and if they continue to do that, they're going to be in for a world of hurt in Coach Olsen's offense, which has yet to be defined. On the defensive side of the ball, I expect to see good things out of the Bucks. Raheem Morris has gone into the uh, laboratory, and he's putting in all sorts of schemes and changes, 4-3, four, 3-4, three, three, four, different sets, different blitzes. I expect to see big things out of Geno Hayes and Quincy Black and a resurgence of Barrett Rude, whose stats didn't drop, but his his point of contact dropped because people were getting through that front line, that, that front four was porous last year, especially uh, when we were playing the two-gap scheme. I think with uh, the influx of talent and Brian Rice and Gerald McCoy, uh, Brian Price and Gerald McCoy, as well as Roy Miller coming into his second year. you got Ryan Sims and Dre Moore. You know, I don't think both those guys are going to be there, uh, but I think you've got a better interior line. Uh, a lot's going to be on Kyle Moore. Can he set that edge uh, on defense? We know what Styles White can do, but they're going to have to get that defensive end rotation to the point where it's consistent, and that will really allow guys like Quincy Black and uh, – and Adam Hayward, when he gets in there, as well as Geno Hayes, to freelance the way they can. On the secondary position, I think the cornerback spot's pretty much open on that second cornerback. to keep the leaves on lock. Rondé Barber's really better suited to the nickel. Uh, Albert Mack, E.J. Biggers, those guys didn't step up last year. We've got Myron Lewis coming in this year. Someone's got to step up and take that other cornerback position from Rondé because he ain't going to give it to him. And in the safety position, Savvy Piscatelli, who had an abysmal year last year, is going to have a little bit of a threat. Uh, from Sean who came over from, uh, from Philly with a Sean Jones. Now I can't remember his damn name. I'm pretty sure it's Sean Jones. Uh, ball hawk, not quite the athlete that Savvy is, but doesn't get beat the way Savvy got beat. Savvy better be on his game because otherwise he's going to lose his position quickly. A lot of people are talking a lot of noise about Corey Lynch, uh, special teams ace. I see him as being a good, re- you know, a good backup guy. He filled in well when Will Allen got hurt last year. I don't see him pushing for playing time on the beginning, but I do see Savvy in a fight for the other position, uh, the other safety position uh, with Snar Jackson keeping the rest on lock. Now, with training camp starting Saturday, hopefully we'll have more feedback. And like I said, I'll try and do a YouTube every night with the highlights. It's only one session per day, which is roughly two hours, so there may not be enough content. We're also going to be doing our shows back two times a week on Mondays and Thursdays on whatthebuck.net. Hopefully you like this information. If you do, let me know about it. If you've got questions or things you want me to pay attention to when I'm out of camp, let me know and I'll do that. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you guys next time.